A lot of politics is theatre. It strikes me that government is very like going to Kelly Tarleton's museum and looking at fish in a tank. It was a baptism of fire for a new government to deal with a massive economic crisis. New Zealand was on its bended knees. Did you think we're in for a roller coaster here? I certainly did. I do think it went too far, ultimately. I was the Prime Minister when we sold Telecom. I wasn't wanting to do that. Why did I you do it? I must say that I found being the leader a nuisance. A nuisance? Yes. You found being the Prime Minister of New Zealand a nuisance? I did. Part of the job of leadership is to lead public opinion, to show them the vistas of Mount Olympus rather than the lowlands of uh, where we are now. Uh, any, any political system has to progress. It has to, has to face the future. The great failure of our political system is that it doesn't deal with that adequately. We have got a problem of climate change on this planet, which is absolutely potentially economically catastrophic. And what do we do? We bury our head in a uh, paddock of dairy cows and pretend it doesn't exist. We put off the evil day because we have a three-year term and we want to remain in power and we're more interested in remaining in power than we are doing the right thing that will save the country from suffering. So at the root of that failure is a political failure or a failure of government or It's what? a failure of policy. It's a failure of having a sufficient regard to the future and looking only at the immediacy of the next election. We are a country that goes through periodic bouts of vigorous reform, punctuated by long periods of sleep. Geoffrey Palmer's contribution to political leadership can safely be put in the category of rigorous reform. A constitutional lawyer, a reluctant politician and one of New Zealand's most prolific lawmakers, he played a leading role as the fourth Labour government tore down Fortress New Zealand between 1984 and 1990. Horrified by what he saw as the near dictatorship of National Prime Minister Rob Muldoon, Palmer entered politics aged 37 to reduce the power of politicians. It was Palmer who introduced a parliament that sat regular hours rather than passing laws in the dead of night, treaty claims back to 1840, the Bill of Rights, state-owned enterprises run like businesses and, as we'll see, arguably much more. In many ways, Palmer, as Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister, was the anti-Muldoon. It seems to me when you combine the strong personality that he had of being Prime Minister and making himself Minister of Finance as well, that combination of power meant that the rest of the Cabinet were redundant. Uh, and indeed, that combination of power brought New Zealand to its knees economically. To what extent then was he running a, an elected dictatorship? Well, he was entirely. Uh, and uh, the New Zealand system of government is very, very favourable to what I would call executive power. In fact, with a very small parliament, the cabinet the, under first past the post could dominate uh, the parliament very easily, get its own way on everything. All it needed to do was to convince the government caucus that they should do something and it would happen. Tell me about the extent of power that this man had. Well, we had a piece of legislation called the Economic Stabilisation Act. That act meant that you could regulate <coughs> every facet of the New Zealand economy without resort to Parliament. You could control wages. You could control prices. You could control interest rates. You could control remuneration. We even had a thing called Carlos Days at one point. I mean, this was an economy that no young New Zealand would ever recognise. You couldn't import things into New Zealand unless you had an import licence. Uh, you, you couldn't uh, exchange your money uh, uh, freely. The, the exchange rate was fixed and, and it was very hard to get money to go overseas. You had to apply to the bank. 
there were the, the imports that came in were heavily restricted. This was not a free economy. This was able to be done by Muldoon without Parliament sitting for months on end. Uh, when I first went to the Parliament, uh, it sat about four or five months a year at most uh, and didn't start sitting till about May. Uh, when uh, traditionally it was understood the cows were dried off and uh, that was the time when Parliament could sit. Uh, Is that seriously why it was...? Uh, well, who knows? It was lost in the mists of history, but it's never convenient to the executive government to have Parliament sitting. Even a measure which was supposed to open up our democracy, like the Official Information Act 1982, passed at around 4.30 in the morning. So uh, this was a time where literally legislation was passed by men, largely, yes. in the dead of night. In the dead of night. And we, I campaigned very heavily against this before I got into Parliament and after. I remember Marilyn Waring coming into the Parliament uh, for some of the debates at that time with great blankets so she could go to sleep during the debate. You talked about some of the big powers that Muldoon had. Um, and sometimes it's the little examples that are very telling too. There's a story about when you and David Longy took over as deputy leader and leader and went to sort out the furniture. What happened? Well, uh, Charles Littlejohn, who was the clerk of the house, ordered a, a new suite of furniture so people who came to my office could sit down. Muldoon, as minister in charge of the legislative department, countermanded it. There you have an executive of the government uh, saying to the parliament, I will decide as executive what will happen in this parliament to an opposition member. That is an outrage in constitutional terms. And, and uh, one of the things we did was to stop that by setting up the Parliamentary Service Commission, which remains to this day. Was there a parallel anywhere else in the democratic uh, world at that time? Uh, I didn't know of one. Uh, and, and you see, as one famous Australian constitutional lawyer said, and it remains the case even under MMP in New Zealand, that New Zealand is an executive paradise. Uh, the sovereignty of parliament in New Zealand, which means parliament can pass any law it likes, it's actually the sovereignty of the executive not of the parliament. And that is why so many opposition MPs have such a frustrating life because they have very little influence over anything. It says something interesting about your approach to power, that you sought power to reduce the power of government. Well, that's true, but that's the, that's the difficulty if you elect a constitutional lawyer to parliament. You say that our current arrangements pose dangers to the peace, order and good government of New Zealand if demagogues take over. Yes, I believe that. Look at what's going on in the United States right now with Trump. If he's not a demagogue, I haven't seen one. And, and so, it's a very fragile system. Until you've had the levers of power at your disposal, you don't realise how fragile democracy is. Why is it so important? Well, because New Zealanders are, on the whole, kept in a state of constitutional ignorance because they don't know they've got a constitution. And the difficulty is they can't find it. It's in so many different places. You cannot locate the New Zealand constitution in one place. It's in some UK statutes, it's in some New Zealand statutes, it's in some prerogative instruments, it's even in standing orders of the parliament. And the result of that is that nobody knows where to look. We've got 25% uh, of the people in this country were not born here. In Auckland, the figure is about 40%. How, and, and the system is built on unwritten conventions, which uh, they said in the 1960s when they examined this question, we don't need a written constitution because we're British. But hello, we don't have that shared so heritage would anymore. if we had a modern day Muldoon? Uh, what would happen is that he could carry a lot uh, more before him than one would hope. And that is the danger of, of having a constitution where anything goes. I don't blame the New Zealand public for not being concerned about their constitution because they can't find it. And if you don't keep your constitutional machinery in good order and condition, you will find that your democratic rights slowly ebb away. But it is still true, isn't it, that Parliament can pass any law it likes, no matter how Yes, it bad is it true, is. and I'm 
absolutely opposed to that. Are you still fighting Muldoon then? No, I don't think it's Muldoon, I'm fighting the system. Rob Muldoon, probably drunk at the time, called a snap election for July 1984. That doesn't give you much time to run up to an election, Prime Minister. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? He lost and the incoming Labour government unleashed a blitz of economic liberalisation. It was nicknamed Rogernomics after Finance Minister Roger Douglas and opened up the New Zealand economy. But it alarmed many in Labour's own ranks. The battles to come helped shape modern New Zealand, but the first fight Labour faced was with the outgoing Prime Minister. Clinging to power, Muldoon refused the request of the incoming government to devalue the currency. Geoffrey Palmer was Deputy Prime Minister and in the thick of the action. This was as close as New Zealand ever came to a major constitutional crisis. The Reserve Bank wouldn't open the exchange uh, markets so long as the situation continued. It only lasted two or three days, but it was really frightening. It was a baptism of fire for a new government, not even sworn in at this juncture, to deal with a massive economic crisis. New Zealand was on its bended knees. Our economy was in the wrecking yard, and it was, people have forgotten how desperate it was. Did you think we're in for a roller coaster here at that point? I did. I certainly did. And we knew, I mean, we had massive deficits at that time. I remember Muldoon saying that uh, the public wouldn't understand a deficit if they tripped over on a, on a dark night. But you can't go on spending money you haven't got uh, and that's what we were doing. I mean, we had to have some drastic economic action taken and pretty quickly. Uh, that led to what I would call something of a juggernaut, where the economic changes became so great and so many that it was very hard for the public to deal with. Uh, and it was, it was done too fast. But, but you have to understand that in a three-year term of parliament, you have to act quickly and you have to get what politicians call runs on the board uh, before you uh, go uh, to the electorate. And that's one of the reasons why I, fa uh, I favour a four-year term of parliament, that you'll be able to get your work done in a more systematic, rational and better way. You had written the 1984 manifesto. Mm. Um, is it true to say that you knew the outline, at least, of what Roger Douglas was proposing, but you fudged it to compromise with the factions in the Labour Party? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means was that I listened to the debate at the Policy Council and tried to write what I thought was a middle-of-the-road policy that was sensible, uh, and I think that was achieved. And, and, and a lot of the measures that were taken were certainly compatible with it, but it wasn't some sort of sleight of hand. You write in your own words, I accept that it was designed to paper over the cracks in the variety mm. of views between the members of the Policy Council, but it was not a misleading document, end quote. The, the charge from many of the critics of these reforms, though, is that, isn't it? This was an ambush. We did not know what was coming. What is your response to uh, that? My response to that is that the government was between a rock and a hard place on economic policy. We ran the summit, the economic summit, to try and get some ideas about how these things might be looked at. The Treasury advice to the incoming government was extremely detailed and, uh, of course, the Treasury hadn't been listened to for seven or eight years on anything. Um, and the whole of the New Zealand economy was still in this, what I would call, um, fortress state. And the if, Polish shipyard, I think, well, was the Well, yes, that was it? Lonnie's expression uh, about how we were running it. And that, Is that, that was accurate? quite accurate, I think. Uh, and the business community had to come to Wellington to get import licences rather than compete. The level of competition in the New Zealand economy was very low. Uh, and, and the levels of production were very low. And, and the gross national product was not increasing. It were, and, and we were 
drastically in debt. And so you embark on this major uh, economic reform, of course, led by Roger Douglas, um, who asked ministers whether if they had any concerns they should put them in writing. It appears to me that you did not, and um, you were quoted as saying the policy seems to me to be quite orthodox. So you, you didn't oppose Rogenomics? No, I didn't oppose it. Uh, it seemed to me that in its initial stages at least, it was a return to what most countries had of a sort of orthodox economy where the market had some sway, but there were controls over it. Now, I, I do think it went too far, ultimately. And it did, well, it became an ideological crusade in the end, uh, which, which I don't actually, I've had something to do with economists. I was a student at the University of Chicago. I've heard them lecture. That is the home of neoclassical economics. I don't trust economists. I don't think economists can predict how the world is going to behave. You can put economists in a line and they, all their predictions will be different one from another. I have come to be very skeptical about any economic advice. And one of the reasons is this, that economists who operate on what I would call mathematical models have a lot of assumptions. And those assumptions consist, first of all, that there is a perfect market. Second, that there is perfect competition. There is uh, perfect information about what is happening in the market. And there are zero transaction costs. It's fascinating because you don't see those reforms as right wing, do you? Not particularly. Almost every other Labour person now would see them as right wing. In fact, well, in fact it, it sort of generated a whole well, force of passion well, still, yes, hasn't it? I know, it? but uh, it seems to me that ideological divides are on the whole <coughs> pretty damaging, misleading, and you get a whole lot of political folklore that is on the whole so you can quite, say, quite, quite misleading. Yeah. So you can say, rationally considered, you're sitting here, you say, Rogernomics was not right wing. Um, I think it was a return to conventional economics. That's what I thought at the time, and I still think it. Uh, but, I, I, but, I, I, no, but just let me say this. Sure. You look at the measures that were adopted, the end of import licensing, floating the currency and giving the Reserve Bank uh, power over interest rates. Um, all the changes that were made, and there were a lot of them, a new Public Finance Act, um, uh, the state-owned enterprises policy that I uh, had a lot to do with, all the economic changes that were made, none of them have been reversed. And you would have to say that if they were a way out of kilter, they would have been reversed by now. They were not reversed by the Clark government and they haven't been reversed by the key government. Why do you think then that Rogernomics is for many people a dirty word still? because a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people uh, were displaced and they suffered and I do think it was done too fast and I do think the ordering of it was possibly wrong, but nevertheless, those adjustments had to be made, or, or a lot of them did, for economic survival. What I, where I think the policy uh, fell apart uh, was when we started embarking on a, progress, a program of privatisation selling telecom. I was the Prime Minister when we sold telecom. I wasn't wanting to do that. Why but did I you was, do it? Well, because I was convinced by the Minister of Finance, David Cagle, that we had to pay off debt uh, and, and to, to keep our economic credibility. Do you, do you regret that? Because the, 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 the policy said, the manifesto said telecom would not be sold. You yes. were in charge of that again. I, I, do you, sitting here today, regret that? Uh, I regret the suffering that we suffered politically from it. But it did seem to me that credibility required us to do that. I passed the economic, the, the state-owned enterprises policy when I was the deputy prime minister. I designed the bill and there was no privatisation in it then because you had to change the act of parliament to privatise anything. Uh, and and we, it it's was not sold to the caucus on the basis that we would privatise. It was that next stream of, of Rogernomics that became intense. And remember this, the great difficulty economically that the fourth Labour government faced was the 1987 share market crash after the election. There, that share market crash was bigger in New Zealand than anywhere else. 
and it lasted longer. It put the economy into a tailspin. It put the politics into a highly difficult situation and it was necessary to regain economic confidence. Uh, I was convinced that we really had to take some steps at that time and of course it was the steps that were taken at that time that led to the collapse of the Labor government because it was the flat tax policy that Roger took, put forward just before the 19, uh, end of the 1987 year, uh, calendar year, which David Longy then uh, disowned in January when there was no political activity going on. Uh, and, and that led to the rupture between uh, David and Roger, which really brought the government to an end. Did you agree with the flat tax package? I certainly agreed with it going through the Cabinet as it did, but there were a lot of adjustments that needed to be made to it. There were a lot of costings that had to be done to it. It was not a done deal as it went through the Cabinet. Well, uh, it was signed off by Cabinet. Well, well of course it was, and that, that's what led to the difficulty, because you cannot have a Prime Minister unilaterally disowning a policy that Cabinet has agreed to. It wasn't a policy, it, there was a lot of work to be done on it. And, and it may well have been, as David Longy's instincts were, that, that this was not going to help those who are least well off. And that's why he torpedoed it. But the work hadn't yet been done. It may not have survived. Uh, and it was necessary to go through the proper processes. So again, it strikes me, you, you're not an ideological person when it comes to economics. No. You thought privatisation, well, if that's the best way to pay off the debt, let's do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I certainly, uh, I'm not ideological at all, really. And, and uh, my ideology comes down to having a good liberal democracy that has underpinnings of total democratic control and accountability. That's what I believed before I went into Parliament. That's what I still believe. And my, my, most of my political activity was engaged in doing those things. Uh, and to some extent, when I became the deputy leader of the Labor Party, I had to engage in a whole massive range of other things that I didn't have any great belief in. A lot of people lost their jobs as a result of these moves. You yourself would have known some of the heartache of that. I think your father was laid off um, yes, from the was. press. Yes. You know, so you would have known. I think he even lost his house. Yes, he did. Yes. Mm. So you would have known the personal cost. Tell me what it was like to balance the, the, the theory and the knowledge that the policy you're pursuing is the right thing to do and the personal impact of that? I think the adjustments are difficult and, and they were not pursued sufficiently quickly in our case. We finally got a relief program going to help people and to give them some assistance and of course we never cut any of the benefits during this period and you remember we put in GST and we adjusted the benefits for that. Uh, we were not about to get rid of the welfare state. I make that absolutely fundamentally clear. That was an axiom of the fourth Labor government and we built a lot of state houses, something that people might uh, be interested in from today's perspective. But, but the suffering was significant because there were a lot of people who lost their jobs and some of them did well and some of them did not. And in retrospect, I would have made the uh, landing for them much better. How would you have done that now? By, by giving much more assistance, by giving them much more counselling, by giving them much more support to get other jobs, by providing help to set up in business for those who want to do that, and quite a few did do that mm. actually. But you, you say in hindsight though that, that you could have done more to help the transition, I guess. Absolutely. And, and part of the problem of that is the three year term. Uh, you, you, if you don't act quickly, you, 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 you can't get it done before the election. And, and that's one of the strong reasons why I support a four-year fixed term for Parliament. A royal commission set up by Palmer considered a referendum on a four-year term, but it never happened. Instead, a far more dramatic change was set in motion, replacing the first-past-the-post electoral system with MMP. 
Geoffrey Palmer is the only one of our former Prime Ministers who backed the move at the time. A move stumbled into by accident and farce when David Longy mistakenly promised a referendum live on television. And we will, uh, in the next term, refer that report to a parliamentary select committee. A referendum will thereafter be held. Well, I was a supporter of MMP. He actually wasn't, uh, but he thought that the Policy Council had approved it, and it hadn't. He misread his briefing notes, is what happened. Uh, seriously? Yes, yeah, seriously. That's what happened. He misread his briefing notes. And, and he went on television? He went on television, and, and of course, that made the caucus uh, not happy. Promising because, a referendum on MMP? Yes, and, and he, he, that was not the policy of the party, because there were only about 12 or 13 supporters of MMP in the whole Labour Party caucus which was pretty big, uh, and, and uh, I was a supporter of it and I couldn't get support for it uh, within the councils of the government. You must have been delighted. I then. was delighted, absolutely delighted. Uh, but of course, uh, after, then Bolger promised it, then uh, uh, the Labour Party had to change and promise it as well. And so it, it, MMP arrived, it reduced the power of the politicians and the main political parties. Uh, it was a much more democratic system, but it was not supported by either of the major political parties. And it arrived because the people voted for it in a referendum. Uh, and I think that was wonderful. So all the big players of the time um, that we remember, Helen Clark, Mike Moore, Jim Bolger, all of your colleagues and uh, foes, if you like, they all opposed it. All they the did. Because? Because it was going to reduce, they thought, the power of the two major political parties. Of course, in retrospect, uh, they have now mastered MMP, uh, the two major political parties, both the Clark government and the Key government have been able to master MMP by having uh, support parties, several of them, who can be ministers outside cabinet and who can be called on from time to time to get matters through. Uh, and so in effect, what has happened is that the management of MMP has been, has been subverted to some extent by executive control over it. Now, um, what it does has done though, it, makes, it has slowed down the legislative process to some extent, and that's a good thing. Uh, but we've also got a much more diverse parliament, many more women, many more ethnic groups, many more political parties, much more political diversity. These are very important features in a democracy that is now a very pluralistic society. Has it reduced the power of Prime Minister? Uh, not to any appreciable extent. So an MMP Prime Minister is just as powerful as an FPP Prime Minister? Not perhaps quite as powerful. Uh, you have to go through more steps, you have to do more negotiation. One of the difficulties of the system is that it lacks a bit of transparency. The negotiations go on behind closed doors. Uh, I, you, you, I learn about these things due to practicing law in this city for a long time and, and the way in which the system actually works underneath in the engine room is a bit different. What do you from mean? The, the negotiations that go on, you never know when they're going on. You never know what the nature of the bargains is. Uh, and, and that leads to difficulties. Have you heard a few nasty surprises about that? Is well, that well I, I work a lot in the resource management area and I do know that deals are done to get bills in and further deals are done to get them passed. And you, what sort of deals? Well, if you support this provision in the bill, I will support your bill. Those sorts of deals. Is that good practice? The difficulty about those sorts of things is that the public has no way of knowing about them now. And indeed, the public doesn't know anything about how the system of government works because the media is in a state of collapse. Uh, the parliament is not reported now. When I was uh, a young person growing up, the papers were full of the debates in Parliament. You could actually find out what MPs said. You wouldn't know what any MP said now unless there was some outrageous sort of uh, sensational uh, scandal. 
I mean, this is this the, the the nature of our representative democracy has fundamentally changed, and people don't get that. They don't understand the implications of it. Uh, there is much less adequate communication between the governors and the governed now. I think that democratic government around the Western world is in some sort of crisis because there's a lot of unhappiness. Look at the level of voting in the 2016 New Zealand municipal elections. Hardly anyone votes. And yet we've got a super city in Auckland with enormous powers. Why would they not vote? Uh, it's quite hard to understand. Do they, are they turned off by it? Do they think it doesn't matter? Uh, I, I have reached the conclusion that we need compulsory voting. Uh, I have come to the conclusion the Australians are right about this at the parliamentary level and at local government level. If you are going to live in a democracy which is supposed to be conducted by the people for the people, uh, then the people should have some duties, they should participate and they should vote. And it should be against the law not to do so. That's right. That's what I now think and I never thought it before. When I've looked at what happened to Brexit, when you get a breakdown of the legitimacy of your democratic system, which Brexit shows, you've got problems. When you look at trumpery in the United States, uh, where you have a, a, a really polarised group of people, what, what the United States needs is a good dose of proportional representation. Geoffrey Palmer, of course, played a major role in bringing proportional representation here. He also presided over a monumental shift in treaty settlements. In 1985, Palmer drafted and passed a new law allowing Treaty of Waitangi claims to go back to 1840, paving the way for the major settlements of the mid-1990s. It was greatly resisted at the time. Uh, and there was, uh, I never got as much mail opposing anything as, as when we did that. Really? No. Uh, and What were people saying? Oh, people hated the idea. There, there, there was a lot of racism in New Zealand then. What sort of things would they well, say? Well, they just felt that the Māori shouldn't have these things, that, that Māori, the treaty was old, that we shouldn't take any notice of it now, that it was part of history. Uh, a, a, a tremendous a lot of opposition to that. But uh, actually, it has worked out better. Uh, and uh, we've had various hiccups with the sort of brash interlude, which didn't get anywhere. It says it's a great credit to the National Party that they resisted that and went on doing the settlements because, like our system of government that the public doesn't really understand properly, they didn't understand the settler government injustices that were inflicted on Māori during the 19th century. They were absolutely legion, these injustices. The confiscation of land, the sharks taking away the land of Māori, and, and the settlements that have been reached do provide some sort of remedy for what was injustice. When I first got into politics, they said the treaty is a fraud. They don't say that now. Now, one MP, national MP at the time, called this the most dangerous bill that has been introduced during my time in the House. But you responded along the lines that New Zealand will collapse as a democracy if government fails to address these issues. Yes. And went on to say that this country will explode. Yes, I lived in the United States. I'd lived in the Southside ghetto in Chicago when I was a law student. Uh, and I've seen what uh, happens if you have an underclass defined by race. And, and in New Zealand, the indications of Maori wealth, life expectation, uh, income, all those things were very bad, imprisonment rates. And, and if, you were not, if you were going to suppress people like that, you will end up with the sort of situation that America has had in the last year or two of racial explosions in the cities of the United States. That is readily foreseeable. The difficulty with democracy is that it involves majority tyranny. The majority can tyrannise the minority. We've got 15% of the population in New Zealand that is Māori. Uh, they are the indigenous people of New Zealand. Uh, it's no use saying that somehow or other uh, we should treat them uh, as if they're not. Uh, and, and, and it's really quite wrong and, and absolutely immoral. To do that. One of the great moral causes of the time was the fight against nuclear weapons. Labour's law banning nuclear ships saw New Zealand booted out of ANZUS and a deep freeze in relations with the US. 
The fate was sealed when the USS Buchanan was not accepted into New Zealand waters in 1986. Many credit David Longy with making New Zealand nuclear free. And I'm going to give it to you if you hold your breath, just for a moment. <laughs> I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> but at the critical moment, David Longy wasn't even in the country, leaving acting Prime Minister Geoffrey Palmer to make the call. The, the difficulty was that David Longy had gone to Tokelau. Tokelau is an inaccessible part of this planet. It is three days steaming away from Samoa. There were no formal, no communication with him was possible that was secure, and therefore no communication was possible. Leaks started coming from the United States and from Australia, saying that a ship had been agreed on and that we better let it in, and political pandemonium broke out in a big way here. I could not talk to David. I did not know uh, that uh, Jamison had agreed a ship. He was, our, um, he was our air marshal and chief of staff and a very good uh, military officer and entirely straight. The advice was ambiguous. And it did seem to me that the Buchanan could have been carrying nuclear-tipped ASROC missiles uh, in which case it would be very difficult to convince the New Zealand public uh, that, that it was nuclear free. So when, when this came uh, up uh, in this way, I thought that it was necessary to make it clear that we were going to support our policy. And I made statements saying that our policy would be followed and the policy was followed. Those leaks that were coming out uh, when Longy was um, en route to Tokelau, where were they coming from, do you know? Uh, they were coming from Washington and Canberra, and they were coming from well-informed sources, and they were designed to put pressure on us to let this ship in. And uh, I must say that they were very ill-timed if that was what their purpose was, because it had the opposite effect. But these obviously, at some point, started from the governments of those countries. Of course. In the knowledge that the leader of New Zealand is away and that it was well, going I'm to Well, I'm not sure point. whether they knew that. They may or may not have known that. Uh, Washington is a big, complicated place and it leaks like a sieve. Canberra does too. Well, this is the big question, yeah. or one of many big questions. Mm. Why did he not brief you before he left? Because I didn't think, he didn't think there would be anything happening. He wouldn't have thought that. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have thought that these leaks would start occurring in the US and, and in, in um, Australia. So he wasn't running away from it? No, I don't think he was at all. You didn't say, oh, David, you could have told me that... Um... No, I didn't say that. Um, the, the, what's the point? Uh, the, the whole question really was settled by the Cabinet without really any difficulty. I wonder, though, whether it was almost settled by you before that because you went public on January the 11th yeah. saying, quote, some in New Zealand fear the government will buckle. I assure them it will not. That's right. Now, does that not mean that you made the decision? No, there? no, that means that the policy will be followed. And the policy was that we would make the decision which ships to let in. And that was precisely the policy that is now embodied in the legislation that was subsequently passed and which has led uh, to the decision to allow a ship in. There has been no change in policy ever since then. That was a pretty strong statement to make publicly as Acting Prime Minister, though, when you could have taken a slightly easier option to keep quiet until I that Prime I Minister didn't, came I out. didn't think that you could possibly uh, do that with a policy of this character. You can't propitiate on a policy like that. You either stand for it or you don't. Uh, and, and we did. And, and David um, uh, then got into negotiations with the Americans about whether they could send a, 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 a FFG-7, which was a lesser vessel. But the difficulty was the Americans, having had the understanding that they'd reached an agreement, which I knew nothing about, would your decision have been different if you had known that? I think if I'd been briefed by David Longy uh, on what had precisely happened, uh, and I, I may well have taken a different view of it. 
um, because he was the minister doing this. I was only acting, uh, and it didn't seem to me that I wanted to uh, completely run this issue at all. I wasn't inclined to do that. I was only forced to do it by circumstance. It was a pretty brave decision, though, for you to take, wasn't it? Your officials had effectively said, let this boat come in, hadn't well, they? Well, I didn't read that way. I mean, we know what the officials thought about, uh, about the alliance. Uh, we always knew that. Uh, the question, in my mind, was very simple. Could we convince the New Zealand public that this vessel conform to our requirements? How were we going to demonstrate that? I thought it was very like a jury trial. I'd done a lot of those in personal injury when I was young. Uh, and I thought, can you convince ordinary New Zealanders by what you can put forward whether this vessel is not carrying nuclear weapons? And improving a negative is never easy. Uh, and I didn't think we could. Like a jury trial? Yeah, because in many ways the public's like a jury. I also think that being free of nuclear weapons is a good policy, and I think it's really important for New Zealand to have a neutral foreign policy. We are too small to get involved in big struggles between big powers. And the boats are back. The boats are back, and that's fine. But they are back on our terms. Richard Preble says you, you actually made New Zealand nuclear free, not David Longy. Is he right? I don't think that's fair at all. Uh, I think David Longy was the leader. He articulated those policies everywhere. He went to Oxford against all the official advice and became a world figure on these matters. He was told in the, in the famous, I can smell the uranium mm. on your breath, he was told not to go? He was told not to go. None of the officials wanted to go. The Australians were apoplectic about it. Uh, and the Americans certainly didn't like it. And, and the difficulty that David had was this. David Longy was a very unusual politician. He was so clever, so full of quips, so amusing, so funny, such a gifted rhetorician that the Americans could not understand his wit. And we used to send cables to Washington uh, of what he'd said, transcripts of the press conference, so that our ambassador could brief the Americans. They, they just didn't get Longy. They didn't understand him. Uh, he had a British sort of wit. They don't get that. Uh, and, and he was so clever. It was a sort of private eye sort of wit. And, and, and it was devastatingly good. And he used to use it at press conferences. Uh, I must say, I'm not sure that was always a good idea, but he did do that. And, and on these matters, it used to drive the Americans spare. But you uh, wanted uh, to stay in ANZUS. Yes, of course, the Labour Party wanted to stay in ANZUS. That was the policy. Did you? Uh, I thought it was probably a, a good policy if we could, uh, but we couldn't. And it turns out, what, perhaps for the better that we were... I think it was for the better. I, I do think so. I think it allowed New Zealand to to forge an identity of its own that was respected abroad. I had talks in places like Japan and Germany and other and in Britain about all of this over the time we were in government. Uh, and uh, it was a bit like um, the mouse that roared, you know. New Zealand is not a very significant country except in the eyes of New Zealanders. Uh, and, and for the Americans, we're sort of wondering what the hell was going on in here. I, when I was the acting prime minister and Longy was away for three months during the whole period of the first uh, period that we were in office, I used to sit in a beehive till midnight signing off letters from Americans saying how grateful they were we were taking Oh, from Americans? Hundreds and hundreds of them. David Longy was Foreign Minister as well as Prime Minister between 1984 and 1987, so Geoffrey Palmer often found himself acting Prime Minister. That and his background as a constitutional lawyer gave him unrivalled mastery of the machinery of government. But the reality of politics and the demands of the media were frustrating for his academic mindset, a tension which increased as the fourth Labour government, now in its second term, began to fall apart. A Deputy Prime Minister spends most of his time firefighting. When things go wrong, you have to fix them. I suppose half my time was spent firefighting in, in those sorts of ways, trying to sort out messes, which always occur in any government all the time, and a great deal of time is spent doing that. 
Uh, and I often resented that time. I, to some extent, I, I treated the uh, Labor Party and the government as a difficult client who had to be given proper advice. You were a reluctant leader, is that fair? That's absolutely true. Um, my greatest ambition when I got into politics was to become the Attorney General. Uh, I managed to secure that position uh, and I was very happy uh, doing so. Uh, and I, um, it was what my career um, aspirations had been in political terms. Uh, and I must say that I found being the leader a nuisance. A nuisance? Yes. You found being the Prime Minister of New Zealand a nuisance? I did. That's quite a striking thing to say. Well, uh, I'll tell you why. There are... The nature of the Prime Ministerial position in New Zealand is that you spend a great deal of time on tasks of no substance whatsoever. You have to talk to the media endlessly. I mean, I remember getting out of a plane somewhere in the North Island being asked by a journalist uh, whether, whether I liked uh, eating um, broccoli because President Bush had had broccoli put on his, on his in somebody dump, some unhappy broccoli farmer had put a whole lot of broccoli in the White House lawn or something. What are you asking me whether I eat broccoli for? I mean, this is ridiculous. The, the Prime Minister has become part of the celebrity culture in New Zealand. The Prime Minister has become less a working part of the Constitution and more a, a um, dignified part, uh, even uh, uh, taking on many of the functions that royalty used to uh, take on. Uh, and, and I found it an absolute drag to go to all these sorts of things where I was effectively wasting my time in terms of policy, but you had to go through the appearances of it. Now, um, I, I just, uh, and, and, and people say you have to do this to connect with the public. Well, I don't know whether Peter Fraser ever connected with the public. He certainly didn't have to deal with television. And he, and he dealt with some very good policies. I think the nature of the modern electronic media has, made, has brought us the celebrity culture. It's brought us reality television. It's brought us trumpery. Uh, and we are going to suffer enormously in our democratic countries. Uh, I, I, just, I just felt that a lot of the Prime Minister's job was persiflage. Chief publicist. Yes. Well, minister in charge of the election prospects of the government, really. So you had more power as deputy? Almost. I certainly think so, given the list of portfolios I had and, and what I was doing with them. And, and uh, you know, the substance and pith of government is a great deal more important than the appearance of it. Uh, and a lot of modern politics is all about appearances. It is remorselessly superficial. It eschews any policy uh, analysis on any serious subject. It regards things as boring when they are very important. Uh, and it really dumbs down the system of representative democracy, which uh, maybe it's designed to do. A lot of politics is theatre. I really don't think the theatre is very appropriate because it gives uh, a great many people a misleading uh, impression of what is really going on. Uh, and it strikes me uh, that government is very like going to Kelly Tarleton's museum and looking at fish in a tank. They're going behind rocks and weed and that stuff and you don't really know what's going on there and the reporters look very closely through the tank to see what's happening and they think they know but they don't. Why on earth did you go into politics then? I went into politics because it's the only way to change things. It's the only way to get policy change. Did you know then what you know now about the downside of being the, having to be a populist and playing along with the media? Yeah, I did. I, I, I knew quite a lot about that because, first of all, I'd lived in the United States. Secondly, I came from a journalistic background, a family, uh, my father had been a newspaper editor, so I knew how politics interacted with the media to some extent. Uh, but 
And I indeed, you'd been a journalist yourself. Yes, I had. I learnt, I was the editor of Salient here at the yes, Victorian and University. And you also I wrote for the I Nelson did. Evening Mail. I loved Met Bill that. Rowling. I nearly became a journalist. What a disaster that would have been. For who? For you me. or journalism? For me. <laughs> So, by accident, Geoffrey Palmer nearly became a journalist. But having dodged a media career in August 1989, he fell into another job he didn't really want. Prime Minister of New Zealand. And even then, it was only when tensions between David Longy and Roger Douglas boiled over into a bitter and very public falling out. And that's what brought the government to an end. And my greatest failure in politics was to failed to heal the breach between Longy and Douglas. I tried very hard. They conducted a lot of correspondence with each other and they used to copy me into it. Uh, and the so they were writing, not talking? That's it and that's wrong. It was not right. How did you try? Did you say, let's go yeah, out? I or mean, what, did you try? What, what I, did you do? I, I did all sorts of things, but none of them worked. These, these people didn't have their egos under control. Uh, and both of them thought they were essential to the government, uh, and probably they were right. Uh, but the difficulty is that you have to work together uh, because a government, any cabinet, is a teamwork. What the public think is that the Prime Minister can do anything, the Prime Minister can't. The Prime Minister has to carry all the cabinet colleagues with him. David was never very strong at arguing for positions in cabinet. He was a good chair of cabinet, but he didn't seem to have very many strong policy predilections of his own. And Roger had a couple of other finance ministers in the cabinet always to help him. Uh, and so th th they, he was able to carry the cabinet with him to a large extent. You were loyal to him to a fault? Well, I don't think to a fault. Uh, it, it probably would have been better if I'd taken over earlier, but I didn't want to take over. <laughs> probably would have been better if you'd taken over. Well, I think the government would have had a better chance of resurrecting itself, but it always seemed to me that once those two fell out, there was no resurrection possible. Longy sacked Douglas from the finance role just before Christmas in 1988, only to see his caucus vote Douglas back into Cabinet the next year. Taking that as a vote of no confidence, Longy resigned. Mike Moore went for the job too, but the caucus chose Palmer's steady hand. I did not want to be Prime Minister. I did not particularly enjoy it. And I've done a lot of other things in my life that, of course, everyone that you deal with in New Zealand just remembers you in politics. They don't remember the other things you've done. But I have had a lot of uh, very interesting things to do in my career. and I've enjoyed many of them. Uh, I enjoyed being in politics, but being Prime Minister wasn't the best part of being in politics from my point of view. Did you at any stage think that you wouldn't take it then? No, I didn't think that. But I did think that the reform program had to be finished. Uh, and, and it was finished to a large extent. And um, I was very pleased that we were able to get there because it was a very fragile period. The caucus was very, very upset by all of this and had been for a long time. And there were other people who were looking for preferment, who were under sectors, who wanted to become ministers, and a whole lot of things like that. Uh, there's a lot of ambitious people in politics, and it doesn't, on the whole, help much, uh, because they all think they're God's gift to creation, and most of them aren't. Uh, and, and many of them are incompetent as well. You said uh, earlier in our conversation that you almost treated the, the party and the government like a client. Mm. Was that still your approach as Prime Minister? Yes. Uh, you have to go to meetings with the party. The party gets very upset with the economic policy. The party liked the nuclear policy but hated the economic policy. Uh, and that became an increasing problem. You find that in your own electorate organisation, I found that. Uh, and, and that has effects. People leave the party. They don't like the policies. Uh, when you're making an omelette, you have to break eggs, uh, and that's, uh, we did a lot of that. This, this was not a government that was afraid of major reform. This was not a government that was calculated to say longevity of the government is the only thing we're interested in. Mm -hmm. It was not a government that thought it was there for power's sake. It was a government there designed to try and improve the situation, the parlous situation that New Zealand was in when it took over, and it never never deviated from that course. Even during his 13 months as Prime Minister, Palmer pushed on with asset sales and major reforms. But with Labour slumping in the polls, 
He was removed from the job with just two months to go before the 1990 election. Labour knew it couldn't win, but in a panicked bid to save as many seats as possible, they gave the leadership to Mike Moore. I didn't fight at all. I had a lot of better things to do. Uh, I, I was quite happy to take the rap for the uh, election uh, being lost. Uh, but the thing, what happened, uh, saved me from being in opposition, which is not a good place to be. And I had plenty of things I could do yeah. and I went and did them. It struck me that you actually went ahead with launching Labor's consumer affairs policy on that That's day. That's right. Now, I did. I think probably if I'd, if I'd been determined to stay, I could have stayed, but I didn't want to. I had a discussion with my wife and I felt, right, that's it. If these guys want to do that, let them do it. <laughs> and even to the point of saying, I can't be bothered with them. I mean, I think Longy described them as pole-driven fruitcakes. And, and uh, I, I understand the, the pressures of, of what I would call electoral disadvantage. I think it's a terrible thing for MPs to lose their seats. I had a very safe seat. Uh, and, and that is a great thing, it's a glittering prize in politics to have a safe seat in those days of first past the post. But uh, I, I, I just think that people who go into politics shouldn't, see, shouldn't regard themselves as God-given people who should be there forever. I think you should get in there and do what you can do and get out. I, I think politicians who stay there a very long time become a danger to the public. Having since gone on to start a law firm, lead the Law Commission, represent New Zealand on the International Whaling Commission and chair a UN inquiry on Gaza, Palmer still has his eye on the dangers New Zealand faces. I think that public opinion polling is destroying politics because what it does, there are no conviction politicians left that I can see. You don't see people who believe anything. If they do believe something, they certainly don't articulate it. What they do is read the public opinion poll and adjust the policy. You'll never get anywhere that way. What is New Zealand's greatest challenge now, do you think? Facing the future. We've got some big problems facing New Zealand. The first problem is climate change, which is going to require massive adjustments to lifestyles, to industry, to econ economic issues and we are not facing up to them. The second issue that we face is financial instability. Uh, the real problems of the 2008 financial crisis have not been solved. They will come again. There will be a lot of suffering. I worry uh, what will happen to New Zealand if the house prices collapse. Uh, and we are living in a buoyant period now, but that won't necessarily go on. We've had massive immigration. We don't seem to know how to handle that. We haven't got the infrastructure we need. Uh, and we've got a geopolitical situation that is inherently unstable. We've got a resurgent Russia. We've got a Europe that's in a lot of pro got a lot of problems, both economically and financially, uh, and, and socially as well, given Brexit. We've got an America which seems to be uh, politically paralysed and, and polarised. So I don't think the outlook for the world is nearly as secure as it was when I grew up where we had a bipolar system called the Cold War. What was your bravest decision? No, oh, I have no idea. Probably buying the frigates, uh, the, the Australian frigates. I thought we had the first, fourth largest economic zone in the world. I thought we needed for our own security and our fisheries patrol and everything else, our ability to operate in the Pacific, we needed a blue water navy. So I spent a lot of political capital buying those frigates. We had options for two more and I was absolutely amazed that the National Party, when it came to exercise that option, didn't buy them. I couldn't believe it. You once described yourself as a detached person. Mm. Are you a detached person? Yeah, I do think so, probably. Um, it comes from an, having an academic background, I think. You haven't changed uh, in that respect at all? No, no. I don't think so. No. Yeah. How did it change you? Uh, it educated me. That's what it did. It tell, taught me more things than I knew before, many more things. And it enriched my life in that sense. And you'd do it all again? Yeah, I would. Despite the fact you don't really seem to like politics at no, all? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but it's necessary. It's necessary. Yeah.